Hello and welcome to this uh, National Archives webinar, uh, which we're doing as part of uh, Who Do You Think You Are Live, the, the week of that. Uh, my name is Christopher Day, and um, I'm a modern domestic record specialist at the National Archives. And today I'm going to talk about how you can trace uh, 19th century criminals, ancestors, or, or not ancestors if you're just interested, using the records of the National Archives. Um, so, we should get going. Uh, the first thing I'll just say, I'm going to have a think about the sort of process um, people go through when they're being processed by the criminal system in this period of history. Um, and it's interesting to look at this flowchart here, um, because every point in it might lead to the creation of some sort of record. Um, so this is sort of after arrest it starts, and you see here we have um, an indictment, which is a formal statement of a charge against someone. Um, and if this gets proved by a grand jury, that's some, some judges, then we have a record of the indictment, which is the formal statement of the charge, as I've said. Um, then we come down here, after the indictment's been made, to um, records of a trial, effectively, to a, to a petty jury of, of jury of peers. Um, and so then you'll have records of the trial, such as the indictment, again, statement of the charge, uh, depositions, which is things like witness statements and supporting statements don't always survive, but we'll talk about that more later. Uh, and other documents, and then we have the, the verdict. Uh, if you're not guilty, then obviously you cease to be part of the criminal system. Um, so that's the end. But if you're guilty, then obviously you're going to have a number of different records. So according to the sentence, whether you have a punishment of some kind, it might be a court punishment, fine or whipping. Uh, it might be a death sentence, um, in which case we have documents relating to the fact that someone's been sentenced to death might be um, a time in a prison or on a prison hulk, one of those boats on the, the coast of uh, the United Kingdom and, and other places. Um, I'm sure you're aware of uh, Magwitch from uh, Great, Great Expectations, as he was living on a hulk, obviously. So we have some records of that. Or, of course, transportation to the colony, that as Magwitch, again, Great Expectations, did have to endure. Uh, we'll have records of people being transported to Australia and also to, uh, to America in an early period. And, of course, also we have records of um, people getting a respite to the sentence for early release of some kind or indeed a pardon, and we're going to talk about those today as well. Um, and let's just speak a little bit more about what we are going to do today. Um, so hopefully by the end of this webinar you are going to uh, have an idea of, of where you can go out looking for evidence of someone being tried and, and punished um, using the records of the National Archives, particularly looking at uh, criminal registers and uh, criminal calendars, and we'll go through that in a minute. We're also going to have a look about where you might go to look for records of trials in, a, in assize courts, so effectively what we call crown courts today. Um, okay, crown courts in 1972, they were called assize courts up until 1971. And of course the Old Bailey as well, or the uh, Central Criminal Court, it is now uh, officially known, although I think we all still call it the Old Bailey. Um, we're also going to cover uh, where you might look for uh, records of transportation and records of imprisonment, and uh, then we're going to finish off by looking at records of um, pardons and respite, uh, particularly uh, criminal petitions and criminal licenses. Um, we're going to cover transportation briefly because it's quite a big subject and this is not the longest of us, um, but I will be directing you to a, a guide when I do cover it, which is, is very useful. Um, now, so we're going to start looking at, by looking, thinking about how do we work out where or when someone was tried. So, if you've established when someone was tried through something, you have an old newspaper article, or there's a you know, family, family story, then you need to think about what court the trial took place in, and whether the records will be here at the National Archives or otherwise. So it's worth noting that the National Archives does not hold all court records. Uh, we hold the record of people being tried in assizes, we hold the court records themselves, and also we hold sort of registers and supporting documents of people who are tried at court sessions. Um, which are effectively similar to a size that they're, they're quarterly local courts. Um, however, if someone was tried at a petty session, which we might call a magistrate's court or a summary jurisdiction court or a police court, um, then they will not be held in the National Archives. It's unlikely to be many details about that person at all, in which case you need to go to your county record office or the county record office for the place that the trial took place in. Uh, you can find details of that uh, using the find an archive um, feature on Discovery. Just bring it up here. So you see, you can search by um, you can search by the name of the uh, archive, or indeed you can use the, the map, which is helpfully divided into regions of the country to find what you're looking for. Um, it's also worth noting um, that 
uh, we don't hold the majority of modern trial records. Uh, we hold some. So, in, as I said, in 1971, assize courts were abolished and replaced by crown courts. There are some records here. Many are still held by uh, the courts themselves or the Ministry of Justice. Um, so, if you're looking for a modern trial, sort of be advised that you may not be finding much at the National Archives. Doesn't necessarily mean that nothing survives. Um, and I'm going to keep referring to uh, National Archives research guides throughout this webinar. Um, they are a fantastic resource. Um, whatever kind of research you're doing. Um, and so we're going to be talking about a few particularly during this webinar, but I will say here, uh, when you know, initially when you're researching these things, the best places to look if you're researching criminal history or criminal ancestors is in the two guides, criminals and convicts, and uh, prisoners or prison staff really give a fantastic amount of detail of what records are available and how you can go about looking for them. But what about if you don't know the details of a trial? Well, all is not lost. So if you don't know the details of the trial, but you have a vague idea of when someone was convicted and their name and etc., um, then there are sort of two options for you to be able to find records. Um, the first are um, criminal registers for England and Wales, uh, which run from 1791 to 1892. Um, they are held in the uh, National Archives record series, HO26 and HO27. Um, HO26 only covers uh, London and Middlesex, and uh, I think this is a bit earlier. But, um, and you can also look in the British Library's newspaper archive, um, which runs for the 19th century. Really useful tool, very searchable. Uh, is available on Find My Past as well now, actually, as a lot of other local newspapers are available as well on there. Um, and then here we have uh, the search page for the criminal registers. They've been digitised and put on Ancestry, as you can see. Got quite an extensive search form there. Uh, I will say, when you're losing these uh, family history sort of genealogy websites, um, you may find you don't get results because you're putting too much information in, so um, it's always worth starting small. Just go with a name, maybe a birth year, see what you get from there, add detail if you get a lot of results. Uh, but don't say too much because um, then you might end up not getting any results at all. So just as an example of the kind of information we can find, starting with sort of relatively basic uh, knowledge of someone, I'm just going to take an example of um, Someone called uh, Sarah Sanders. Uh, she was sentenced to uh, seven years penal servitude in uh, 1878 for uh, larceny, um, which is theft, effectively. She stole from her father. And she was also given an um, additional day in prison for attempting a suicide, which is, which is unfair. Um, it sort of exposes the um, occasionally unpleasant nature of the Victorian justice system. I say occasionally unpleasant. Um, so let's have a look there with what we can find about Sarah. So you can see I've made a search of her um, in the criminal registers just using her name and her date of birth. And we can see here that we get some results for her at the top here. Um, there's a reason why there's two entries because she was convicted of two crimes, one of the, uh, the theft and the other one of the, um, of the attempted suicide. Um, so you can see here she is and here she is again. Um, and it gives us details of her conviction, etc., etc. Um, so she's sentenced to seven years in, in, in penal servitude and then um, also three years of police supervision and again imprisonment here with one day. Uh, so penal servitude is sort of more serious prison, serving in a national jail, a penitentiary, if you will, whereas imprisonment could be in a, in a local jail. Um, these HO26 and HO27 registers uh, will provide you with um, you know varying degrees of detail, but they might give you. Uh, stuff like uh, someone's age, um, their birthplace up until 1802 afterwards, that's not recorded, when and where they were tried, which is obviously what we're looking for in this case, um, when and where they rece received, I mean, so after conviction, what might be happening to them, that's often um, recorded, not always, um, their date of execution if they're sentenced to death, or their date of release if they're found not guilty, um, and it also might tell you by who they were committed to trial by, so i.e. the magistrate um, who heard their case and then sent them up to the higher court, and uh, again to whom they were delivered, so you know where they went after the trial to put them. Um, equally, searching for Sarah in the um, newspaper archive gives us quite a lot of results. So you can see here I've made a search for um, her name and just Exeter because I know it's the nearest large town to where she lives. Um, and you can see here, we've got a newspaper article. Uh, it's basically a report of what's happened at the Exeter Quarter Sessions, where Sarah was convicted. 
and we see an article on, on Bruno, a bad character. Um, let's read the first passage. Um, now we're going to move on to sort of some prison registers, well, sort of after trial calendars of people who were imprisoned and what they can help tell us about prisoners as well. Um, sometimes providing more information in these newspaper articles and um, the criminal registers which I've looked at. So again, we're looking for um, Sarah Sanders here. And this is on Find My Past uh, in their collection of criminal records uh, from the National Archives, uh, England and Wales, Crime, Prisons and Punishment, 1770-1935. Really extensive uh, set of records that have been digitised. Um, and we can see here, for instance, Sarah is recorded in um, H.O. 140. This is actually for an earlier date of trial. She'd been convicted before. Um, and again, down 1877 here and 1878 here. And these H.O. 140 are after trial, trial calendars of prisoners. Um, now, basically, they're, they're lists, for the most part, printed of prisoners who have been tried at quarter sessions and at assizes. Um, they're usually arranged by county. I say usually, they always are. Um, and they will include their following information. Um, so the uh, sort of the number, giving sort of like the number of the conviction, uh, the name of the prisoner, their age, their trade, their previous convictions, Name and address of the committing magistrates, those who sent them to trial. Um, perhaps record the date of the warrant for their arrest. Um, gives details of when they were received into custody, the offence they were charged with, uh, and sometimes before 1969 that will include the name of the victim. Uh, before whom they were tried and when, the verdict of the jury, the sentence, uh, or the order of the court, if it's you know, sort of a, a punishment or a fine instead or something like that. Um, and yeah, as I've said, you know, you can see here, but just by searching for um, her um, conviction year and um, another conviction year and her birth year, we get loads of records for Sarah Sanders. Um, often with criminals, we'll create many, many records. It goes back to the flow chart I was talking about. At the start. Every part of the process can create a record and they can vary in detail. So you really can build up quite an extensive picture of someone. Um, now, there are also sort of separate, discrete records of uh, trials for people who are tried in the Old Bailey or Central Criminal Court, and actually these can be often be more rich than the people who are tried in the provinces. So I'm just going to take a look at those now. Uh, let's see here. Before I stop, I've forgotten that I have an image of Sarah Sanders' HR140 calendar. You can see some more details here. So here she is again. Uh, she is um, again listed twice. You can see attempted to commit suicide, and then we also see. Her um, larceny, um, larceny conviction, and actually gives quite a lot of detail about exactly what she stole. Um, not much, actually. It seems a lot of unfair to make the sentence that she got, but such is the justice system at this point. You can see this is a law and dress. Um, now, moving on to trials in the Old Bailey and the Central Criminal Court. Uh, so, as I said, these will create different records. Uh, for instance, um, rather than being in HO27, the criminal registers for England and Wales. They're going to be in HR26, which covers Middlesex, obviously no longer a county, but sort of covering most of London. Um, and it allows you to have these other sets of records that can build up the picture. Um, so you can see here, this is a HR26, again from Ancestry. Uh, it's from 1794. And I'm interested in a man called Peter Farrell. Um, so you can see his name is recorded in the day he was tried, as is his crime, which was a uh, Officially described as burglary at night and the stealing of sundry things, nicely vague. And you can see that he's trans sentenced to seven years transportation, which is effectively a life sentence abroad. Um, but also, if you have someone who's tried in this period, particularly, or sort of the early 19th century in the Old Bailey, you're, you're really in for the luck because um, you'll find that there is a website called Old Bailey Online, which has transcribed the proceedings of the Old Bailey uh, from 1674 to 1913. Searchable online, all for free, searchable by name, you can also browse by date and by crime. Uh, it's a really fantastic resource, I'd recommend having a look at it. And from that you can see, you can actually get a verbatim testimony from people who are tried at the Old Bailey. Um, and you can see here that we can find our old friend Peter Farrell. Although in this case he's uh, recorded with a different spelling, which is sort of a reminder if you're doing research um, in sort of the earlier part of the 19th century or the latter part of the 18th century. Always re remembering that people have many different spellings for their names. 
that this is his testimony before the court. He was convicted, but it's it's an interesting read. Um, let's see this. And then, I mean, some other examples. Uh, later on in the 19th century, um, there is a sort of parallel criminal calendar for people who are tried at the Old Bailey uh, in the record series Crim 9. Uh, it runs from 1855 to uh, 1949. People who were convicted at the Old Bailey will still appear in the um, HO140 uh, after trial calendars of prisoners, but you also find their record in these particular ones for the Central Criminal Court. Um, and these give details, again, sort of um, what people were charged with, the date of the trial before being tried, and the verdict of the jury. Um, and so here we can find, I'm just looking into the um, the trial of Oscar Wilde, famously tried at the Central Criminal Court um, in 1895. Um, and here you can see from Old Bailey Online uh, details of his trial here, just search for his name. Unfortunately, by the latter part of the 19th century, you don't get anywhere near as much detail and um, sort of uh, verbatim recording of proceedings as you do in the early end part of the 19th century. But are still very easy to find, and then you can see by searching for him on uh, my past, we can see he was actually tried twice, and that's why there are four records here because he's being recorded in the Crim 9 calendars of prisoners, and, and he's also being recorded in the H1140 Middlesex calendars of prisoners at the same time. Um, just here, a copy of his entry into the Crim 9 um, calendars. Okay, so we've had a look at um, how we can find records that are created by people being tried, which will give us information about when their trial took place and what happened to them afterwards. But I'm now going to um, take a quick look at how we can find the records of trials themselves, the records that were generated by the court during the trial. So again, there is a division between um, London and the rest of the country. So if someone was tried in the Old Bailey, I would recommend always checking Old Bailey online because you're probably going to find a huge amount of information there relatively easily. Um, also, you can see the National Archive Research Guide, trials in the Old Bailey and the Central Criminal Court. That will give you an idea of what records we hold and what records are held elsewhere. Um, but we're also going to look here at uh, criminal trials and assize courts. Um, you can see it's long run here from 1559 to um, 1971. Have a look at the kind of records we can get from them. Um, so when you're looking for records of a trial itself, there are three main types of records. So you have Crown and Jail books, which are sort of the minute books of the court. They will give you the name of the accused, uh, might give you the names of the jury as well. The charges, the plea, verdict and sentence. Um, you have the indictments, which is the formal statement of the charge spoken about, usually also annotated with the um, uh, plea and verdict, and occasionally the sentence. And also the depositions, um, which are basically sort of witness statements before the trial, um, all sorts of things really usually don't survive unfortunately apart from um, in sort of very serious sort of capital capital offences things that people could be sent to death for so for instance murder or a sort of serious riot um, some of the later ones uh, it contain photographs and maps and stuff like that and occasionally appeal papers um, but there is a more extensive description of what those records consist of and how you can go about finding them in the guide Criminal Trials in English Assize Courts 1559 to 1971. There's one for Wales as well, but I'm not going to cover this one. Um, now we are going to move on very swiftly. Um, so we thought about how you can find out details of how someone was tried and what happened, then look for records of the trial themselves, but we can also think about what records are created by people being punished. And so we're going to briefly look at transportation. And then we're going to take a bit more extensive look at um, prisons. So transportation, um, something which are, you know, sort of very alive in the popular imagination through costume dramas. Um, basically, it's the moving offenders uh, out of uh, Britain and to its colonies, effectively. Um, so it begins in 1717 by moving um, uh, prisoners, transporting them to the American colonies. Uh, this ends in the latter part of the 18th century because um, there's a revolution in America and it stops uh, being part of Britain. As is well known, I'm sure. Um, but in 1787, transportation to Australia, uh, New South Wales particularly, and to Tasmania, or um, Van Diem's land, uh, as it's known as Dutch original, uh, begins. Uh, and this carries on um, for just under 100 years until 1868, uh, when the last co convicts were transported to Australia, mostly because the locals were not fond of it happening. Although actually, by the 1850s, transportation was very much on the decline. 
Um, the go-to place to look for for records of transportation is the research guide, Criminal Transportees, so I would recommend looking at that, although we're going to have a quick look at what sort of things we might have. So we're looking here at the uh, case of Mary Lambert, Lambert who was convicted of uh, larceny, very common crime, um, again at the Central Criminal Court in London, or the Old Bailey would have known the time, actually I think it was called the Central Criminal Court by then, in 1839, and she was sentenced to um, seven years transportation. Here she is in HO26. Um, giving details of her name, and you can see her sentence here. But there are also um, sort of quite a lot of um, digitised convict records about that Mary Lambert. And Ancestry is the uh, place to really go to look for records of convicts being transported. Um, here she is in HO10, which um, these are lists of male and female convicts and former convicts in colonies, given particulars as to their sentences, their employment, their settlement in the country, land and cattle they might have required, and other information. Uh, it gives lists of pardons that were granted, lists of convicts embarked for an arriving in New South Wales, there's general musters and censuses of convicts, and settlers uh, from 1828 as well. Um, but this one particularly details that Mary sailed on the uh, ship, the Gilbert Henderson, lovely name for a ship, arriving in Tasmania in 1840, um, and it also gives details of what convict ma master she was assigned to, and you can see it there. Um, so whereabouts is she? Let's have a look. There she is. Let's see. You can see the ship Gilbert Henderson here. Also, you can see CCC, Ditto, she was both tried at the Central Criminal Court. Um, now, you can use these and these details to uh, also find out about um, what life were, was like for convicts on their journey to Australia or afterwards, uh, which is, um, I can probably say with a fair amount, actually, usually quite unpleasant. Um, this is an extract from a surgeon gen from the Journal of the Surgeon on uh, the Gilbert Henderson convict ship from the 16th of May 1840. These are in a record series called ADM 101, which uh, consists of medical journals from ships. Um, really interesting series, uh, very well catalogued, so do search if you have an uh, ancestor or someone you're interested in who went on a convict ship over to Australia, there may be a journal surviving. And this journal really records um, sort of the idea of how sort of harrowing and unpleasant the journey would have been. The terrible weather they suffered and um, the pre prevalence and um, continued prevalence of uh, seasickness and constipation for a very long time. Um, now we're going to move away from the, the shores of Australia and look close to home and uh, have a look at what sort of prison records we might be able to find for a convict. Uh, and we're going to focus on the case of a man called William Scott. Um, so William Scott was uh, convicted in 1851 at the York Assizes. He was 47 years old and he's convicted of shooting with intent to murder. It's a very strange case. So apparently um, he'd walked into his uh, friend Sophia Widdop's house and having received no provocation of any kind, he'd sat down on a fire and then uh, subsequently drawn out two pistols. Um, he shot the fire uh, from about two yards away, so more or less point blank range. Uh, fortunately, he only broke one of the ribs, ribs that glanced off the bone, um, and she managed to run out of the house. Um, he Scott subsequently remained where he was and shot himself in the side, not the side of the head, just his side, with the other pistol. Um, fortunately, they both recovered fully. Uh, however, he was um, sentenced to 10 years transportation. But this is in the 1850s, transportation is very much on the way out. So actually, if we look through the records for him, we find he never left England. And there are a number of records collated. You can see here that I've um, searched on the um, Fire Pass newspaper archive again uh, and found um, an article from the Heron for Times. It was a relatively uh, interesting big case. I searched for William Scott and shooting York. Um, without any dates in there, and found um, some, quite a few articles quite quickly. Now, as you can see, I've said before, all parts of the criminal process can generate a, um, a, a sort of a record, and you can see that if searching for William Scott and his trial date off on my path produces quite a lot of results. Some of them are the one we're looking for, not the joy we're looking for, um, but the ones that are about him can tell, together can tell us quite a lot about how he spent his sentence and his crime and, and his conduct in prison. Um, so we can start looking at the uh, HR27 criminal registers, which is at the bottom somewhere around here. My image is much more than yours. Um, some of the other HR27s are not him. So we can see William Scott um, 
shooting a person with intent to uh, murder. And the sentence which is given the sentence to 20, 10 years transportation. Um, doesn't show up in the image I have because I've cropped it. Well, I'm just be able to see anything. Um, now, by the 1850s, uh, transportation, as I've said, is on its way out. So even though people are sentenced to transportation, they're actually much more likely to spend their time in penal servitude, which is made uh, formal in law in 1853. Um, basically, they'll be running uh, in government-run convict prisons, or they are in prisons in Hulk, so these floating jails I was talking about. Very unpleasant. Um, and so, actually, we can see here that uh, Scott was initially uh, sentenced to transportation. He was going to go be sent to a convict prison, but there wasn't enough room for him, so he was kept in Wakefield, which was, was a county jail, as opposed to a um, national convict prison. And that creates a record in this record series called HO23. Um, basically, overcrowding and other factors meant there wasn't always a, enough space to place a convict in a um, government-run prison immediately. So the government would rent cells in county prisons. Um, and Scott was rented, had a cell rented for him in Wakefield until um, 1852, October, when he was moved to the National Convict Prison of Dartmoor, which also itself creates records. Um, and so there are a number of different records in the record series HO8, which basically gives lists of um, convicts on hulks in convict prisons and um, in insane asylums, lunatic asylums, as they refer to them at the time. Um, and it's really interesting this get year by year. So we can see here that Scott is being held um, in Dartmoor, and this is him from uh, 1853. So he is here. You see again, shooting with intent to murder, tried at York, the date of his trial, his sentence of 10 years. Also gives the fact that the surgeon reported him to be healthy and his conduct was very good, which is, is nice to know. Um, Scott was also actually released early, and again, for my past has details. You can see here the front cover of uh, the uh, HO8 uh, list there. Not immediately apparent, sometimes it's difficult to know what prison you're dealing with. If you flick back through the images on Find My Past, you should eventually come to the cover page and know the details of where someone's being held. But Scott was released early, which is also available on Find My Past, and this is when we get into these really interesting records of respite and pardon. Um, so we can see here, this is. Um, Scott's license, he was relieved on license, um, effectively early release was something developed in the 1850s. Uh, tickets to leave, they were referred to at the same time. Um, you're bound to give behavior, otherwise you'd obviously be re reincarcerated. Um, before Scott was licensed, he actually submitted a petition for clemency um, to the Home Secretary. Um, there's no court of appeal at this time, so basically you um, appeal directly for reduction of your sentence to the Crown, who's represented by the Home Secretary for some sort of mercy. Um, and we have a huge amount of these petitions um, presented on by or on behalf of the criminal between 1819 and 1858, and they're in the record series HO17 and HO18 at uh, the National Archives, indexed um, by record series called HO19. You see an entry for Scott here. Many of the petitions and the indexes are on Find My Past, and they're some of the most detailed records for criminals or other people in general, working class people particularly, available in 19th century Europe. Um, now, Scott is um, very much on Find My Past in HO19. Um, you see him there. Uh, but here the petition is not immediately apparent, and that's because it's been catalogued uh, wrong on Find My Past. But we can find it using the coding in HO19, that's what it's originally turned to. So we can see his name here in this code here, which is. Um, uh, 35110, I believe. Uh, yes, 351.10, basically, which means that um, we can find Scott's petition in um, the 351st box of the record series HO18, and there will be the 10th petition um, within this box, effectively. Um, although we can find his petition via leaving out on file past via, you can see the reference here, so HO18 slash 351 with the reference using that index. Although we can actually find his petition on Find My Past with the reference using that index. Although we can actually find his petition on Find My Past uh, if we don't include his conviction or birth dates. Um, and it's really detailed, there's a number of different petitions. It gives us a much better idea of his circumstances, his standing in the community before he was convicted, his character, details of the crime and explanations of why it may have happened. 
uh, also ideas about why it should be released. Apparently, he suffered from indigestion, but it was so bad that it was debilitating, and that's why it should be released early. And they mentioned that he, he was after some time. Um, now, if you look in HO19 and find that someone has a code which isn't structured like that, so isn't two numbers, is uh, maybe some letters and, and, and the numbers, an alphanumerical code, then rather than the petition being in HO, HO18, it will be in the record series HO18, HO17, I apologise. So, uh, for instance, the letter code had been uh, FM15, and then we know that that petition is in, contained will be in HO17. Um, so we take the case of uh, John Land Langridge, um, who petitioned in, against his 1826 conviction for poaching in 1827. His petition is given the code FM15. Um, his petition isn't on file like ours, but we can look for it in the National Archives catalogue discovery. See here, searching by the by the code there gives us the result, although actually some of these petitions have been really well catalogued by volunteers. Great amount of detail there. Um, so, I mean, yes, petitions and licenses are some of the richest records we have for criminals. Um, they record their conduct in prison, their character, particular details of their crime and their lifestyle that you wouldn't find in the other records we've looked at, which are more administrative. And their future prospects after leaving prison or, or after they've been transported. Um, Scott, for instance, gives us an idea of what he looked like. So he was sallow, he had grey hair and grey eyes, um, seemed to have a little bit of facial scarring, and he was described by the um, as being rather stout. I suppose the nice thing about the sort of um, unfeeling nature of Victorian prison authorities is they're quite frank about people's appearances. Um, also, we have uh, records of uh, our old friend Sarah Sanders, and including a picture actually from her license in the 1880s. Um, some of the licenses are some of the few criminal records that include photographs, which are really nice to find, obviously. Um, and we also, with Sanders, get quite extensive medical reports, which sort of further demonstrates um, her own quite fragile mental state and the sort of quite callous treatment that she received from the prison authorities. So, let's see the records there for Sanders. So we've sort of looked at, uh, you know, how we can find out about when someone was tried and what sort of crime they committed and the sentence they received. We've looked at how we can find records of the trial itself and the proceedings there. And also we've examined, you know, records of how you can find punishment and also how you can find records of release. And so, you know, I will reiterate what I said at the start, but when you're looking for someone who's been involved in the criminal system in this period, you know, 19th century, early 20th century, late 18th century, Every part of their transfer for the criminal justice system is likely to generate some sort of record and it may be preserved and each one will allow you to build up a picture. The best place to start, other than our research guides, which will probably tell you the same thing, is to look in uh, the criminal registers in HR26 and HR27 and you know, also maybe look in the newspaper collections as well if you have some vague details. They can be really useful. Again, the newspapers can provide you with sort of this, this character and this sort of colour that you might not get from the administrative records. Um, and I'll reiterate it one more time. If you're in doubt about where to go next, um, check the guys on the National Archives website uh, and you know they explain what records are available and how to find them and they do it step by step. And if you're still having trouble, then obviously you know there are ways to get in contact with the National Archives. We're always happy to help people with their research. Um, so I hope that webinar has been useful and you are filled with a zeal to research criminal genealogy now. Uh, and I will leave it there. And um, yes, thank you very much.